want to thank uh, Dr. David Zolzer uh, for helping out in uh, interviewing Dr. Rout on the percutaneous stabilization of U-shaped sacral fractures using ilocecal screws techniques and uh, early results. So we will uh, play Dr. Rout's video and then please ask any questions in the Q&A section um, and we'll uh, hear from Dr. Rout with any thoughts and uh, comments he has after the video. So today I'm speaking with Dr. Chip Rout from the University of Texas in Houston uh, to discuss his paper uh, that was published in 2001 entitled Percutaneous Stabilization of U-Shaped Sacral Fractures Using Iliosacral Screws, uh, published on the early techniques and results. Dr. Rout, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us about your early experiences and what made you want to do this study? Well, this paper was published in 2001 and actually tracked back before that for a cohort of patients. And I saw my first patient with a displaced, uh, unstable U-shaped sacral fracture that I recognized in 1990. And uh, fortunately, it was a traumatic spondyloptosis so that it was really obvious, but it was in a morbidly obese young guy and he had neurological findings in his feet that really alerted us to the problem. We couldn't see it on his plane films except for a lateral sacral view. And it took three exposures in the, uh, because of his size to identify it. And then, of course, we saw it on the CT scan. So he was our first patient to really alert us to that. And then reviewing the literature in the early 90s wasn't quite as simple as it is today. And it became pretty obvious that this diagnosis existed in people, but it just had never really been published except in one textbook I could find an account of bilateral sacral fractures with displacement. It was in John Conley's uh, textbook and it recommended spicocasta, spicocasting treatment for this. Two of our patients early on in the 90s with not so much displacement led to the screw fixation. We had, uh, or I had two patients that I treated with bracing that developed um, neurological problems. They went from being neurologically normal to having one had uh, really dramatic cardioquina symptoms as a result of the displacement of what was previously a minimally displaced fracture in clinic when he came back in two weeks with neurological findings. He had fairly significant displacement. So that drove us to trying to find a way to do something simple to stabilize. And how has your practice changed since 2001 when this study was published? Well, in 2001, we didn't have long iliosacral screws. So all we had was screws up to 130 millimeters. And we first started using 6.5 fully threaded screws. Then when cannulated screws came about, we started using those, but they, they were limited out at 130. So if you notice in the paper, the, the screws go from left to right and right to left to in an attempt to lock threads. So we were doing the best we could to use iliosacral screws to hold it. But you can imagine we didn't have uh, screws beyond 130 millimeters until 2006. So that was even five years after this uh, study was published. And this cohort of patients came from even before then. So Any other limitations of the technique that you found uh, in your years of doing? Well, the limitations would be if there's not a safe pathway for the screws to be inserted. And um, fortunately, for most patients, there are almost always safe pathways. We are rarely find a patient with uh, osteology and injury deformity that obviates the ability to put in uh, safe iliosacral screws. The technique has evolved into um, long transsacral screws as many as you can put safely into the conduit of bone, the area of opportunity, and then depending on where the transverse limb is, if the transverse limb is at the S1, S2 area, then we tend to just use the fixation in the upper sacral segment. If the transverse limb is at S2, uh, then we can use screws at S1 and S2 in those pathways, and then it if it's a U, a pure U, then we just use iliosacral screws. If it's a Y or a backwards Y or an H, then that gets into fixing the anterior ring as well, and then um, maybe adding on lumbar pelvic. And which, for which patients are you consulting with your spine colleagues? Well, we we have a good symbiotic relationship, uh, and so 
we'll, I'll discuss almost everyone with them just to make sure that it's not something that they think needs to have additional lumbar pelvic fixation. But typically, it's the uh, really severe H's and Y's and backwards Y's. For almost all the U sacral fractures, the spine surgeons don't uh, get involved unless there's some need to do acute decompressions uh, as a result of the, the neurological findings. If a patient has a neurologic uh, lesion, uh, have you found it to have any effect on that? I'm sure. Your experience. Yeah, so if, if you find, if a patient presents and the diagnosis is made in, in a temporally reasonable manner, like acutely, and they have some type of positional neurology, for example, we had a lady that came into the clinic not too long ago and she was sent from our spine uh, colleague and when she would stand up and walk around she had fallen several weeks earlier three or four weeks earlier and she was okay for a week or so but then for the last week or so she wasn't okay when she would walk she would lose a sensation in her feet and her feet would she would get like foot drops on both sides and her instability was very or her neurology was positional and you can treat those patients early help them with the reduction by just putting them uh, in a good position in the operating room and then stabilize them and then that way they don't have this instability that's related to the neurological finding and how successful do you think we are now at identifying these patients in an appropriate time point and treating them hey, do you still see deficiencies in your practice where patients are referred to you late with unrecognized injuries yeah so the the acute ones from high energy trauma are, are caught. I think everyone's pretty alert to the paradoxical inlet now in the emergency centers across the globe. I think the paradoxical inlet is a real thing for the displaced ones. I think the, uh, the advent of CT scans in the trauma patient picks up, I would say, almost 100% of these. Uh, the, the patient population is still having a lot of delayed or misdiagnoses is the elders who fall and they get uh, pretty much pushed away and so we still see you know sometimes i just had a lady who had fallen two months earlier and had neurological changes and the diagnosis was still missed um, until she finally found our, her way to someone who can see the diagnosis i've also had patients who've been to four different emergency rooms you know over a two-week period uh, recently trying to just get care uh, where the diagnosis was not identified either in certain situations they weren't imaged uh, or they were not identified on the images or they just finally uh, got a CT scan and, and, ident and identified it so but not, not so much in the young trauma patients that I think I think most of those get found. You're still bracing your patients post-operatively after fixation and when are you uh, usually letting them weed bear? So we used HTLSOs because we had to go down to the hip and those were pretty cumbersome. We used hinged hip thoracic lumbar sacral orthoses and those were custom made for the patients and uh, some of them were compliant and some of them weren't and it was a mess. Uh, I think with the advent of improved technique and also implants, once we got screws that were long enough to give us transsacral fixation and we started learning more and more about filling up the pathways with multiple screws at multiple levels when possible, then we had improved stability. And then we also added lumbar pelvic stabilization when that's necessary. So we don't use braces anymore. Okay, well thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you.